the Sunday worship celebration from the First Church in Albany. Good morning and welcome to a Sunday worship celebration at the First Church in Albany. This broadcast was recorded on April 30th, the third Sunday after Easter. The liturgists this morning are the Reverend Amy Jo Hawley and the Reverend Wilbur Ivins. Today's preacher is the Reverend Dr. Greg Mast, Senior Minister of the Church. We welcome Ted Phillips as our guest organist for today's service. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. welcome you this morning to our worship here at the historic First Church in Albany. We're pleased that you're with us. If you're a visitor today, we especially encourage you to sign the visitor's card so we can greet you by name on Sundays to come. A special word of uh, welcome to our guest organist uh, today, uh, Ted Phillips. Um, Mary Bond uh, took a fall yesterday and uh, hurt her wrist. She is here this morning and will direct the choir, and Ted uh, graciously is filling uh, in at the organ uh, today. We come from many places into this holy place, from many families to create this God's family. We stand, we greet each other, and we listen for the sound of the organ, which will call us to worship. As those worshiping here in the First Church Sanctuary exchange greetings, we extend greetings to you, our radio congregation, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.
we come now to the litany of thanksgiving for creation. And as you can see, the center aisle is filled with symbols of creation. We invite you to join us uh, in this litany as, uh, as we share in thanksgiving for all that God has done in the world. In the beginning, when God began to create, and the world was dark and empty, God created the gift of light. God created the gift of water, and it was good. God created the gift of soil, and it was good. God created the gift of a proven plant, and it was good. And it in this day in which we celebrate the gifts of worship and music and art, we offer to God the gifts of our hands and imagination. The gift of painting and sculpture. And it is good. The gift of pottery and weaving. And it is good. and the gift of the music of our hearts. Praise be to you, O God. Come now together to make confession of our sins unto Almighty God. Let us pray. 
O oh God, we confess that we are not the people you created and called us to be. In the light of Easter, we see the shadows of our days. In the love of Easter, we recognize the selfishness of our souls. In the hope of Easter, we discover the hollowness of our lives. Forgive us, O oh God, and raise us to this new day so we may serve you in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue our prayer of confession in the silence of our hearts. And we join in these words of assurance. When we confess our sins, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We give thanks, O God, of sacred stories for the witness of the Holy Scripture. Through it, you nurture our imaginations, touch our feelings, increase our awareness, challenge our assumptions, and open our eyes. Bless, we pray, our hearing of your word this day. Speak to each of us, speak to all of us and grant that by the power of your Spirit we may be hearers and doers of your word. Amen. Our lesson is taken from the book of Acts, the ninth chapter. Listen for the word of God. 
Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here am I, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. Myself, I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. We now invite our children to join their leader at the chancel steps and to proceed to a special worship in the chapel at this time. I begin this morning with a confession. Of all of the biblical characters that I can think of, I think I would least like to meet Saul. Of all of the saints in scripture, my friends, he is the one that uh, is probably one of the least likable characters that we'll ever run into. We meet him for the first time at a public execution, literally, at a public execution toward the end of the seventh chapter of Acts, Stephen, who was one of the young deacons of the church, was uh, about to be killed. Now, we ask our deacons to do a great many things around here. We've not asked them uh, to, uh, to consider stoning yet. But he literally was going to be stoned to death. 
And as folk took off their cloaks, they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Luke goes on after the execution and says and writes, and Saul agreed with what they had done. And then Luke goes on and says, and he then begins ravaging, that's the, that's the English translation of the Greek term that's used, ravaging the early church, going door to door, literally, and pulling out both men and women and throwing them into prison if they believed in Jesus. A few chapters later, we run into this same Saul, probably a brilliant student. We know him to be uh, the son of both a Roman and a Jew, and so he held uh, citizenship in both the Roman Empire and in Palestine. A brilliant student getting permission from the high priest, deciding that Jerusalem really wasn't big enough for his inquisition. It was time for him to go to a foreign territory, and off to Damascus he goes to do exactly the same thing, to search out those people who belong to the first church in Damascus, to pull them out, and to send them off to jail. My friends, if we stare long enough into the eyes of this, uh, of this man, we see a fanatic. Someone said to me in the drive-in service uh, earlier, here's a person who doesn't have a, uh, have a kind of a half way of doing anything. Everything is whole hawk. Huh? There's no half speed in this person's soul. And off he goes. Inside of this man is a passion that, uh, in which all civility is lost. And he goes to throw folk into prison. The story of the Damascus Road is a familiar one, a mysterious one. He's traveling along, and one moment he's standing, the next moment he's on the ground, one moment he's seeing, the next moment he's blind, one moment he is fully in charge, and the next moment he's being led around like a little child into the city. This is an appropriate story for us to read on the third Sunday of Easter because uh, this is a story about resurrection. Although he hadn't been crucified, indeed he was dead to God, Although he hadn't been buried, indeed he was three days without seeing and without eating his own time in the tomb, if you will. This is a story about resurrection. Well, as difficult as it is for me to want to meet and spend any time with our friend Saul, there is a person, a kind of invisible person in this story that often we don't talk about who I find intriguing and attractive. And his name is Ananias. Ananias is sitting at home one morning, minding his own business. And God comes along and whispers to him, Ananias. And he says, yes, here I am. And, and God says, I want you to go and visit someone for me. And Ananias says, fine. And God says, his name is Saul. And Ananias says, time out. Time out here. You, uh, just a moment here. I, I, I have the sense that maybe Luke has cleaned up the conversation a little bit for us. But I would suspect that Ananias says to God, you're crazy. You don't understand what you're asking me to do. This is the man who stood by while Stephen was killed and agreed with it. This is the man who goes into people's homes and takes them out and throws them in prison. This is the man who's gotten permission from the chief priests to come here to Damascus and to begin the persecution here. And you want me to go and visit him. Thank you, but no thank you. And God says to Ananias, go. Have you ever thought about what would have happened had Ananias won the argument? What would have happened had, had, had he not gone? What would have happened if God and Ananias would have had this bit of conversation and Ananias would have remained stubborn and not gone? Now, I know we're walking on kind of thin ice here because we're, we're, we're um, imagining what would have happened. 
But I would suspect that Saul would have been caught in a kind of purgatory. He would have known enough not to go back to Jerusalem, but he would not have had enough sight to go on. He would have known enough not to go back, but would have not have been supported enough to go forward. He would have uh, known enough because of the Damascus Road experience not to go back to his cronies in Jerusalem, but he would not have known enough or have been loved enough or supported enough or had enough vision to go forward to serve God. I would suspect Saul would have remained in Damascus a blind and paralyzed man had Ananias not moved from caution to courage. Now there's something about Ananias that I find attractive and I, I, I think it's the cautious part. You know, if I would have been there, I think I would have been whispering in Ananias' ear, don't go, don't go. You know, you just don't know what happened on the way here to Damascus. The guy may be faking it. Just to draw out the Christians so that he can put them in jail. Or maybe he's already forgotten the experience. And that by the time you arrive, already the handcuffs will be out and you'll walk in and off you'll go. Don't go, Ananias. Don't go. It's the cautious part of Ananias that uh, we find attractive, don't we? There's a part in each of us that says people don't change. You know, I think it's deep in, in, in each of us. Let me, let, me, let me try something. I think, it's, I think it's the part of each of our souls that, that finds it difficult for us to change, that believes it impossible for anybody else to change. You know, we know how difficult it is for us to change, so we think other people can never change. They won't change. They can't change. The litany kind of wears us down and calls us to caution. And we say, ah, the Damascus Road experience, the change that people claim. They talk about seeing God as they throw people in prison. And I say, be cautious. But something happens in that conversation with God in which Ananias moves from caution to courage. He goes. He goes and he touches his enemy. He goes and he touches the person who is blind. He goes to the person who has the power to throw him in prison and perhaps even to take his life. What remarkable courage to put his whole life on the line believing in resurrection. You see, you know, it's, it's something for us to come on Easter Sunday morning and to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. That's pretty safe because it happened 2,000 years ago. But when we have to talk about the resurrection of you and I and Mary and George, then it doesn't get very safe any longer. It's a risk. It's a risk to believe that people can change, that we can change. Now, the story isn't calling us to be crazy. It's not calling us to put caution and reason to the wind, but it's calling us to move beyond caution to courage, to believe that we can change and others can change, and what it requires is for us to reach out, to touch. The story of resurrection is only completed it's only completed, it's only made whole when Ananias moves from caution to courage. You know, God could stop Saul on the way to Damascus. He could blind him with light and he, he could paralyze him, but it took the very human touch of Ananias to change him and to make him whole. I kind of like Ananias. He's cautious, but he is courageous. He does, in the end, believe that people can change. You ever wonder what happened to Ananias? I think all kinds of strange thoughts when I read Scripture. Whatever happened to this guy? You know, we, we, we never find him again. He never shows up again. 
He's, uh, we don't know if he was married, if he had children, what he did for a living. We, we don't even know if the experience with Saul changed his life as much as it changed Saul's life. What we do know is that one morning, long ago, Ananias lost an argument with God. And in losing the argument, Saul was changed forever. In losing the argument, Saul became Paul. In losing the argument, a person was dramatically changed. One who was blind could see. In losing the argument, one could even argue that the whole early church was born because Ananias moved from caution to courage. I still don't want to spend any time with Saul, but I'd love to spend a day with Ananias to learn the mystery and the magic of moving from caution to courage and participating in the risk of resurrection. Amen. Now to the one who was, who is, and who is to come, be all honor and glory this day and forever. Amen. God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beauty of the creation and its diversity, 
in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ and in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of our love, our talents, and our material possessions. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and in what is ours to give as we receive our morning offering and hear the gift of music. share our joys and concerns at this point in our gathering this day. Joys are, are many. It's a joy to be alive in this God's world and to have about us so many reminders of God's love and providence. A joy to be here and be part of this company and to have before us and subsequently before us downstairs evidence of 
the gifts that God bestows upon his people. A note from the Good News Basket. Thankful we are to the many artists in the church whose talents we untalented can enjoy. I'm sure we're all talented in one way or another. And we are grateful those to, to, to those who, who share those talents today in the varied uh, products of their ingenuity, their skill, their concern, their love, which we celebrate on this Arts Sunday. Among our concerns, uh, some of our folks still in the hospital, Sue Putnam and Joanne Farrell Patterson. We continue to remember Nicole Marsh Sebastian at home, and our sympathy goes out to Gertrude Dorn on the death of her mother, Edith Russell, this past week. And we remember the family of Alice Titus, the memorial service held here yesterday. It was a reminder to many people of the, the life of Alice and what she contributed to, to church and community. And we continue to remember those who suffered loss in the tragedy in Oklahoma City, those who lost loved ones, those who continue to wait, those who work in the debris, and those who work in the lives of all who grieve. And we remember them this day in our time of concern. And we join now in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, we acknowledge you to be the Lord of light and of truth and of beauty. And we thank you for creating us in your own image, for entrusting us with reason, with imagination, with freedom and creativity. We thank you for making us capable of comprehending the wonder of all that you have made and all that you have done. We thank you for ties of family, for human love, for friendship, for the enlargement of life that comes through the sharing of gifts. We thank you, Lord, for teachers, for institutions of learning and craftsmanship, for libraries and museums and art galleries and theaters and concert halls. We thank you for the excitement of education, the discovery of vocations and avocations, and for the surprise of new thoughts. We thank you for the wide horizons of travel, for the meeting with other minds, the opportunities of leisure, the, and the pressure of work that has called forth strengths we never knew we had. We thank you for Christ present in the midst of his church, training and encouraging us to live together. We thank you for the fellowship that nurtures us in Christian graces and offers us opportunities of service. We thank you for all who spur us on to hope in Christ and to live upon his bounty, for all who uphold us when we fall and who bear with us when we fail and for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, opening to us your love and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We pray now for those who govern this and every land, who govern our state and our cities and our towns, that it may be their purpose to free us from all injustice and misery and war, that everyone may labor in peace for the welfare of all. We pray for all the members of this, our family in Christ, and especially for those who are sick or afflicted. We pray for those who live in our presence every day, husbands and wives, children, grandparents, all the members of our families. We pray for our friends, for those who, with whom we work, for all who help us by their presence, by their affection, and by their example. And we entrust to your mercy all who are in difficulty, temptation or, dis or, or depression, all who live alone, who have no one to advise or encourage them, all who are mistreated or scorned. Grant help to all who 
have had to flee their homes and live in exile, separated from their loved ones, and be with all who are sorrowing this day. Give the calming power of your gospel to those who are filled with bitterness and hatred, and that all may find a way of reconciliation and peace. Watch over us all, O Lord, and grant these our prayers, which we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we invite you to join us immediately following the choral Amen in Zimmerman Hall for refreshments and to appreciate the art of our congregation and for the afternoon to come. We go now into the world. Be gentle with those who are weak. Bring faith to those who are struggling. Share love with those who are broken. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.
You've been listening to a Sunday worship celebration at the First Church in Albany. Preaching this morning was the Reverend Dr. Greg Mast, Senior Pastor of the Church. We at First Church are pleased that you chose to worship with us this morning, and we invite you to be a member of our congregation every Sunday. Join us by radio here on station WHRL, FM 103.1 at 9.30 a.m. Should you care to join us in person, we offer two choices. During the summer months, we have a short drive-in service, which meets in the large parking lot next to the church at 9 o'clock. Or you may attend the regular Sunday morning service in the historic First Church Sanctuary at 10.30. You will find a warm, friendly welcome at either service. Thank you for listening. May the Lord bless you.